Good afternoon. My name's Jonathan Cooper. I'm the president of the Royal Aeronautical Society. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to the inaugural Mary Jackson named lecture. The one piece of housekeeping before we start is that there is going to be a Q&A session following the lecture. And so can I please ask you all to submit your questions via the questions function on the, on the framework. OK, the Society has established a new name lecture to celebrate the work of the individuals from BAME communities within aerospace. This has been titled the Mary Jackson Lecture in honour of Mary Jackson, who became the first black female aerospace engineer at NASA in 1958 and was featured in the third book and the film Hidden Figures. You may remember that we signed a memorandum of understanding uh, with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and I'm delighted, and indeed we're all delighted to be working in association with the AIAA to present this lecture today. And hopefully we have some attendees from the USA joining us. We're also joined by Claudine Farre from the AIAA and Richard Gearing from the RAES, who are the chairs of the respective diversity and inclusion committees, and you'll be hearing from them after the lecture. I would now like to present our guest speaker. Our guest speaker is Dr. Mujige Cooper, and she's currently the Planetary Protection Lead for the Europa Lander concept at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, having recently served as the Planetary Protection Lead of the Mars 2020 mission. She was responsible for ensuring spacecraft compliance to the cleanliness requirements while interfacing with several entities within JPL, vendors, and NASA HQ. UGJ is a recipient of several awards, including the NASA Early Career Public Achievement Medal, the Charles Alachi Award for Exceptional Early Career Achievement, and JPL Voyager Awards for Technical Leadership. In addition to all this fantastic work at JPL, she also enjoys public outreach, collaborating with schools, lecture series, and also using social media. Okay, Dr. Mujiji, enough of me. I'm really looking forward to this lecture. Very much welcome you here, and thank you much for giving the talk. Over to you, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and, and thank you for that great introduction. Uh, so yes, my, my name is Dr. Mujige Cooper, and today I'll be talking to you uh, about the importance of planetary protection and how it relates to this Mars 2020 mission that is coming up, uh, that is on its way and almost to Mars. But before I get started, I just wanted to give a, a little bit of honor to Mary Jackson. Um, as many, actually all of you on this, uh, this lecture can relate with, uh, navigating your career, your professional career, is almost like a maze. And back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it was even more of a maze for women in sciences, uh, women of color, and in particular for black women um, it, back in the day. So it's, it was very, we're thankful, I'm thankful, to the trailblazer Mary Jackson, uh, who really blazed a trail with all of the revolutionary work that she's done. Uh, just to give you an idea, a little bit of background about her. She was born on April 9th, 1921 uh, in Hampton, Virginia. She had a dual uh, bachelor's degree in math and physical sciences from Hampton Institute. She was hired by NACA, which was the predecessor to NASA, uh, in April of 1951 in a segregated unit. Uh, which meant that she was in a completely different unit where it was only African-American people that are able to, to work in that group. Um, and that was at NASA Langley Research Center. Uh, she eventually petitioned the city of Hampton to get permission to take graduate classes at a segregated school, which is just, if you could imagine putting yourself in that shoes, those shoes, it's just nerve wracking. So it was a very brave, one of the many brave things that she's done. And then she became the first African-American engineer, female engineer in 1958. Um, she did a lot of trailblazing work also in supporting um, the hiring and promotion of female and minority employees. 
And she did a lot of outreach uh, to include with the, include, including the Girl Scouts, uh, among many other uh, organizations. Uh, she had two children, uh, Levi Jackson Jr. and Carolyn Marie Lewis. And she retired in 1985 from NASA. So she has had a tremendous career and has forged the way for people like me. Uh, just a few parallels between our, our, our backgrounds. So my hometown, half of my life I spent in New Jersey uh, and the other half was in Hampton, Virginia. Um, so many of the sites that she grew up with, I also saw um, as, a, as a kid growing up. Um, I also got my education, my bachelor's degree from what is now called Hampton University. It was Hampton Institute when, when she went there. Um, and my first job was validating data from NASA. And eventually I did four co-op rotations at NASA Langley. Um, I'm, I share a passion for outreach and education and um, I'm just so glad to, to be here. And I really appreciate the Royal Society uh, honoring Mary Jackson with a named lecture. I think that really uh, puts yet more, uh, more of a spotlight on her legacy. So transitioning to Mars 2020, just to give you an overview, to the left side of the screen, you can see just a, a CAD drawing of what the Perseverance rover looks like. Um, so Perseverance is actually recently named by um, by a, a child, actually, there, there's a competition that happens um, internationally where you can submit a name and, um, and name the rover. And that happened for several, several Mars rovers in the past. So um, Perseverance was aptly named and perfect for the year 2020 uh, because we had to persevere through so much and we continue to do so. Um, but the thing about this rover is it has a lot of great instrumentation and when you have a lab on wheels that is 34 million miles away you can't just bring it back and repair it if something goes wrong so we have to make sure that all of the instrumentation that we put on this rover is robust uh, that there are redundancies and that it can really withstand the environments that we're tr that we're exposing it to this martian environment um, there are several science goals that this mission is trying to accomplish. So the first goal is to determine whether or not life ever arose on Mars, to characterize the climate of Mars, to characterize the geology, and to prepare for human exploration. Another one of the coolest things, I mean, there are so many things about this rover that is just so exciting, but one of the most exciting things is the Ingenuity, Ingenuity helicopter. This is going to be the first rotorcraft flight outside of Earth anywhere. It did not happen on any other moon or any other planet or any other body in our entire universe, except for on Earth and soon uh, on Mars. So it's really exciting. Um, as you know, here on Earth, we have seven, 760 tor. Uh, on Mars, it's seven tor. So with 1% of the atmosphere, you really have to design this rotorcraft in a way where it can fly. You don't have a lot uh, to generate your lift. So the actual um, rotorcraft is about four pounds. The very long blades that you see there, um, is, it's extremely long. It's, it, it rotates in, at a very high RPM, 2400 RPM. And soon we'll be able to demonstrate that we can fly rotorcraft on another planet. So pretty, pretty insane. Uh, just to give you an overview of the mission. So this is just the, a general from, from launch to surface operations. So launch occurred on an Atlas V rocket. Hopefully you all tuned in to, to the launch itself. Um, it happened on July 30th of 2020. And it's currently in its seven month cruise set to arrive in February of 2021. Uh, entry, descent, and landing is, uh, I'm sure you all have heard about the video, Seven Minutes of Terror. Uh, it is just a, a feat of engineering. Uh, a lot of amazing, brilliant uh, people gathered together to make sure this happens. Uh, and has, they have actually enhanced the um, terrain uh, relative navigation because you can't joystick the landing. You can't control it live. This is happening so far away that by the time you get any signal, that event is, is long gone. 
So all of this has to happen autonomously and with a, a very smart computer and a lot of programming such that it can land in the place that you have designated. Um, so that's going to happen very soon uh, in, within the next month. And then the surface operations are going to happen. It's going to the rover is qualified for about one and a half Martian years uh, worth of operations. Just to give you an idea of where it's landing, it's landing here in Jezero Crater. This gives you an idea of where all of the prior uh, Mars rovers landed. But here we've targeted Jezero Crater. And the reason why is because Jezero Crater used to be uh, the bottom of a lake bed. Here you can see where the water feeds in and you can see the lake bed here. And here you can see it's all dried up. This is a modern day picture. And if you were to uh, want to search for life here on Earth, where there's just a, a plethora of, of life that exists, one of the main places that you would go is you would go to the bottom of a lake and just dredge up the bottom of that lake bed. And you will find just an enormous amount of life and a diverse, uh, diverse population of life. So that is kind of the, the thought process and the logic of why Jezero Crater was targeted. So if we're going to find any signs of ancient Martian life, this is the place to go. So it kind of sets us up for success. Just to give you an idea of some of the instruments, I won't go over each and every one. Uh, if you go to uh, mars.nasa.gov backslash mars2020, there's actually an interactive view that you can find where you can click on all of these instrumentations and also the, the chassis, the, the mobility, the suspension, the uh, cameras, and really get to, to, uh, to understand more information about each and every component. Uh, but there are some key components that are really exciting, um, such as the weather system, um, META. There's a weather station that's going to give us an idea of the temperature, the wind speed, the wind direction, um, and other factors that will allow us to, to understand the weather there at Jezero Crater. Um, there's also um, scientific instruments that will allow us to do uh, non-contact science and, and understand the geology of the surface before we even acquire samples. So that's, gonna, that's one of the key things. You only have a limited amount of samples you can take. So these devices allow you to really be very picky about where we're taking samples. And that brings me to my personal favorite part of this mission, which is the sampling and caching system. So there are a collection of of 43 tubes that this Perseverance rover is carrying. There are also five witness tubes. So it, as you're doing experiments, in order to understand whether or not the signal that you've acquired is a true signal, you have to compare it to a negative control. So we actually have five tubes that are essentially negative controls that are opened and exposed and closed at particular points in time so that we can understand what the background is leading up to the collection of that sample. So we have those five tubes for the negative control, and we want to collect at least 20 samples so that we can return a set back to Earth one day. Um, just to give you an idea of all the operations that occur inside of the belly of the rover. So once you look at the surface, you, you could abrade the surface of Mars and do these contact uh, non-contact science interrogations. So you can look with Sherlock, with Moxie and see um, or sorry, Sherlock and Pixel, and see whether or not the geology and the biosignatures are such that you really are compelled to take a sample. And once you decide to take a sample, there are several uh, instruments in the interior of the rover that allow you to assess that sample. So there is a volume assessment probe. There is a visual camera that allows you to look down into the tube and, and see the sample. Um, there are places where you can also seal the sample. So there's a seal. It looks kind of like a PEZ dispenser. And um, e the, each PEZ dispenser has oh, seven different seals that you can dispense on top of these tubes so that you can seal it, engage the seal, and then cache it and eventually deposit it on the surface of Mars for future uh, collection. So here's a, uh, a little animation of how that collection, that depot strategy is going to look. 
So you can imagine as you're collecting samples along the surface of Mars, eventually you can drop a set of tubes along the side or along the ground and continue to acquire samples and then do the same thing as you continue to uh, explore the surface of Mars. And eventually, in association with the European Space Agency, uh, which are, are great partners that you know we we can't do this alone, right? This is a this is a global endeavor, and so you can see here this cartoon represents this Mars 2020 mission that is on its way. It's going to acquire samples, and then eventually ESA and NASA will collaborate on a method to bring it back to Earth. Uh, eventually, there's going to be an orbiter that will be sent that will collect. The, the cached set of samples and return it to a sampling uh, receiving facility. So it is a joint effort. We cannot do this alone. And there's already a partnership that is forming with the Europe European Space Agency to make this possible. So this is kind of where my job comes in. So my job is planetary protection. You can imagine as I'm describing collecting samples on the surface of Mars and bringing samples back, I'm sure many of you have in the back of your mind, well, how are we doing this in a way, well, how are we exploring these planets in a way and how are we bringing samples back in a way where it preserves the natural environment of those target bodies? And that's where PP comes in, planetary protection. So my job, at least for the 2020 mission, is to make sure that when we sent the rover out that it was clean enough that we can uh, be assured that we're not spreading Earth contamination to Mars, especially if we're trying to search for life, it enables us to do better science. Um, and vice versa, when we eventually bring the samples back, we have to make sure that these samples don't contain anything that may inadvertently harm Earth, Earthlings. So that is what planetary protection is, and that's my job. And you may be wondering, well, how do we how do we do this? How do we implement planetary protection? And it's uh, it takes many different ways and many different methodologies. Uh, one of them is cleaning, cleaning the hardware. So most of the hardware that you see, the rover, um, the the um, heat shield, the back shell, um, many of the component, the solar cells have all gone through a high temperature process, such that many of the microbes were killed. Uh, but to verify that, cleaning is quite easy, but keeping the spacecraft clean when you have to build it up, when you have to test it in different environments, is the difficult part. So we make sure that in addition to cleaning the hardware, that when humans interact with this, this uh, the spacecraft, that we are wearing things that we call bunny suits. So you can see here, this white garment is called a a bunny suit for slang because you look like a large bunny with no ears. Um, and it it allows us to keep the most prevalent contaminant or the, the most threatening contaminant away from the spacecraft, and that is humans. So humans can, contain more microbes than we do human cells. Uh, so we are we're definitely a cesspool of bacteria, bacteria that we need to survive. Uh, but bacteria that we would not want to transfer to other planets. Uh, we also do, we have a few more tricks up our sleeves besides bunny suits and cleaning hardware. Um, we also have to protect sensitive surfaces. So this is a picture of the stacked, or, or of the um, kind of consolidated, stowed um, Martian rover. And it's upside down and it's on a spin table because we have to understand where the center of gravity is and just make sure it's um, aligned with our calculations. And so you can see in this picture, these are the wheels and these wheels have been covered up with amorstat and taped with capped on tape. And the reason why that was done, it was actually done right after we baked these wheels. And these wheels are baked out because they do touch the Martian surface and could possibly come into contact with the samples that we're acquiring. So we want to make sure it stays as clean as possible for as long as possible. So we cover those up for planetary protection reasons. This area that's highlighted in the middle, this is the bit carousel. This is where all of the abrasion bits, the regular regolith bits um, are all stored. Um, and so we have to make sure those are also protected 
even more than all of the, the rest of the, the hardware. Everything is protected in a clean room, but we're just take, making doubly and triply sure that it stays clean. So it's actually in a HEPA filtered bio barrier uh, so that it doesn't get recontaminated. Uh, similarly, with this, is, this right here is the coring drill. And we also keep the parts that are going to contact the Martian surface covered also till the last minute to make sure it stays clean. So here are some examples of, of what we do to try to make sure that, that this stays cl is clean and stays clean all the way till the end. Um, other ways, so ways we have to assess whether or not we've done our job is we sample the spacecraft. We take either a swab, it looks almost like a Q-tip that you use, um, hopefully not in your ears, you're not supposed to. <laughs> but we take Q-tips, so it looks like Q-tips, but they're actually uh, Copan uh, cotton swabs, um, I'm sorry, Puritan cotton swabs, and we take them and we swab the spacecraft, or we have larger uh, wipes if it's a larger surface area. We take those samples and we extract the microorganisms from that sample, and we grow it up in the lab, and we analyze what is on the surface. And we have international standards that were set you know, by NATO, by COSPAR, it's a Committee on Space Policy and Research, so such that we can minimize the amount of contaminants, microbial contaminants on the spacecraft. So one thing that we look for specifically, it's called bacterial endospores. And these are microorganisms that can form a seed-like structure. And the, the seed-like structure can stay dormant for millions of years, all, tens of millions of years, um, maybe even longer, uh, until it finds a suitable environment so that it can germinate and grow. And these are the mi kind of microorganisms that we are specifically looking for um, to make sure we limit those because they have the highest potential of surviving the trip between Earth and Mars. So typically what we do is we sample, we grow and identify what's there. We actually archive the microbes. Whatever we grow up, we archive them and we have archives all the way from Viking, the Viking spacecraft in our freezers, just to understand what is what is on the surface of the spacecraft and what what kind of what mechanisms of survival do they have. And in addition to that, because you can imagine that growing things up in the lab has its limitations. Only 0.1% of microbes could be could be cultured in a lab. So we also take samples and we extract the DNA. And that way you're not just limited to things that could grow on triptych soy agar, you're, you can look at everything. And so we take that, we extract the DNA, we archive a set of the DNA, and we also look at the sequencing and understand what specifically is there, independent of the culturing methods. And this allows us to have a passenger list of possible microbial contaminants. So to give you an idea of how many samples we've taken, so we've taken 13,000, over 13,000 swabs, over 3,500 wipes, we've taken over 300 air samples, and over 1,000 genetic samples of the spacecraft. So we, we've been working, <laughs> um, and we really wanted to reassure ourselves and the community that not only did we answer the question of, is the spacecraft clean enough, but because we're taking samples and we're going to eventually bring them back, we wanted to really do a, an over-the-top job in assessing what specifically is there. And so we have, like I said before, these international requirements set on a spacecraft that lands on the surface of Mars, and we have met all of those requirements with margin, actually. Uh, with actually a lot of margin. For our total score margin, we have 25.4% margin. So we're, we're even cleaner than what we are supposed to be by the international standards. So we did all that work and we got to la the launch pad, um, and which hopefully you all saw on the 30th of July. And as you know, we are in transit. Uh, we are going to be landing on the 18th of February. Uh, and and hopefully you'll all tune in to that. And yeah, just to to conclude, the key takeaway is let's let's be good custodians of our universe. Uh, as you explore, if you are uh, designing instrumentation, if you are 
designing missions to other planets or bodies. Keep planetary protection in mind uh, and make sure you explore responsibly. Thank you. Dr. Cooper, thank you so much for, for your really interesting presentation. We've had a good few questions uh, come in, but there's still time to ask questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do so on the questions tab and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next sort of 15 to 20 minutes. So if I may turn to the first question we've got, we've had one from uh, James who says, um, what applications of artificial intelligence do you see being included in future NAR uh, NASA missions? Yeah, I mean, already uh, artificial intelligence is is a necessity. It's our future. I mean, really autonomy, autonomous uh, robotics is the future. It is the present and the future. Um, a lot of the things that we're doing to include landing, right, entry, descent and landing, that cannot be done uh, with human ground in the loop, right? We need uh, smart computers to understand the terrain, to be able to control it and guide our ability to land safely. So yes, there is a, a lot of room for um, AI and, and autonomy. Okay, thank you. Um, have another one here from uh, Muli who asks, um, uh, she's a student of aeronautics and she says, how, how, how do you get involved into, into this sort of field? You know, what, what, I mean, guess what, what advice might you give to someone who wants to get into to planetary protection or even into sort of NASA more generally? Yeah, uh, for planetary protection, it's funny because I didn't uh, grow up thinking, I want to be a, a planetary protection engineer. <laughs> um, but the, the way I stumbled upon it is um, I, while I was a co-op at NASA Langley, I did a lot of research in plasma physics. And with that interest, I wanted to continue my PhD in, um, in plasma physics, plas plasma engineering. And thankfully, there was an existing grant that uh, was funded by the planetary protection officer at the time, Cassie Comley, and um, she wanted to apply plasma to essentially kill any extreme microorganism that we could find on Earth. Um, and that's in preparation for any future mission where there's something that maybe we need to clean uh, that may be uncleanable by traditional methods. So I worked on a technology to solve that problem. And so that's how I got into planetary protection is really from the engineering side, which is not the most traditional way of, of getting into planetary protection. But I highly encourage you, especially if you are an engineer, to, to still pursue it because that engineering mindset and, and designing and developing tools with the understanding of the biology and how you may affect the science um, is a really critical um, a, a critical way of thinking about the problem and, and is a way to really tackle a, a big problem. So yeah, uh, that's how I got into it. And if you want to get into NASA in general, I mean, the key thing, if you, I've talked to many, many NASA employees and there's no one way of getting into NASA um, per se, but the thing is everybody has pursued their passion. You have to love what you do. You, you can't do something just because it may get you to NASA. So number one, pursue what you love. Um, and number two, I would highly encourage internships. Um, so much of my journey and many of the, the um, my fellows journey um, involve either a co-op or an internship with NASA. It's great because then you can see what you may want to do or maybe what you don't want to do, which is just as useful. <laughs> um, and, and then that will allow you to build a network and connections with people uh, inside of NASA. So I highly encourage internships and co-ops. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so the next question we've had is from Nadia. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, about the collaboration with European Space Agency. Um, and she's, her question is basically, uh, how do we assure effective communication in communicating the results of the theories with, with the other nations, particularly across language barriers? I mean, so perhaps you can talk about how is the science of the results shared, maybe? Yeah, that's that's a million dollar question. That's, that's a question of a uh, future project manager right there. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have done collaborations before just within NASA. Um, if you look specifically at this mission and, and you saw all of those scientific instruments, I've had to go to uh, Spain twice, to Norway once, uh, because several of those instruments actually come from international partners. And it was 
it, the key is early on uh, conversations to understand you know what the, the expectations are as far as deliverables uh, but there's always one thing that I, just warms my heart is every single collaborator both in the United States and internationally really had the desire and the excitement of sending something to Mars and that just makes the communication channels so open and so free because we're all on the same team and that's what makes the the communications uh, a, a lot more but spirited, right? Because we all want to send something to Mars or send something outside of our solar system. So that truly helps. It's always a challenge, clearly, uh, because of the the gaps, but it's always a challenge, period. But even with vendors, right? There's always a gap there where, okay, you have to transmit your expectations. So it's always hard, period, but it's so, e it's so much easier when everyone's on the same team. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've had a question here from Nina, who says you, you've obviously talked about um, avoiding contamination from Earth or contamination from Mars, but she says, uh, what are the chances of the vehicle picking up biological contaminations en route? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I, I believe, <laughs> I mean, just based on our understanding of how prevalent life is uh, in our universe, it's a very low chance um and that's that's the great thing about exploration is you know and if we detect that you know hey on our negative controls we can see that we picked something up along the way um that's that's the beauty of science and exploration is if we figure out that we're wrong about that we're going to update <laughs> update the understanding but the likelihood is very very low okay uh we've got another question here from uh, francesco who asks about uh, the atmospheric instrumentation on the mission and says, are there any sensors measuring atmospheric electrification properties to measure properties such as the electrification of dust? And if not, do, are you aware of any future planned missions that will have this in instrumentation? Yeah, there. so that instrumentation is not on the 2020 rover, but in general, I, I mean, it, it, electrostatic discharge is something that we are very, concerned with right one bad spark and you can fry a circuit board it could you know be mission ending so there are other instruments that we leverage that have been for example on the international space station to understand the electric how electric currents propagate and just to, to make sure we understand electricity period <laughs> uh in space so there are other experiments that we leverage to understand how it translates to our mission to make sure that everything is done in a safe way so that we don't jeopardize the mission. So that's yeah, a very important factor because we don't want to uh, to fry anything. Thank you very much. Um, so we've had here, uh, we've also talked about the, the samplings on this mission, but we've had a question here about uh, what mitigation processes do you think would be in place for when humans go to Mars to present, prevent contamination? Yeah, that's a that's a really a great question because I mean, my job completely changes when we send humans to Mars. Uh, my cur currently the, the the whole thrust of planetary protection is to prevent microbial contamination, inadvertent microbial contamination. But once we send humans there, we know that we're covered with microbes inside and out. So it, it's definitely going to evolve what planetary protection looks like on Mars. Um, and yeah, the, the the key thing then is to make sure whatever colonies that might be established, you know, once we get to that point, um, that we don't still inadvertently send some contaminants that may, for example, ruin the crops, right? You, plantar protection just evolves. Uh, if you're relying on an ecosystem, you also want to make sure that ecosystem is preserved. So yeah, to, Humans going to Mars is is definitely going to change the landscape significantly, but yeah, it's just an evolution. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we've got a quite a specific question here from Jonathan, who says, um, how many spores are permitted on the most sensitive pieces of hardware, such as the drill bits or the insides of the sample tubes? I love this question so much <laughs> because we spent so much time to make sure time energy um, to make sure that the most sensitive pieces that will come into contact with the Martian soil, or even the things that are adjacent to the parts that will come in contact with the Martian soil are ridiculously clean. Now to give you an idea of how clean it is, 
Um, so not only do we, we have a, a normal precision cleaning method, but we even enhance that further to make it more effective. And after that, we expose it in a chamber at 150 degrees Celsius for about 26 hours. So essentially we kill everything. So the probability of contamination uh, is less than the 99.9% .9 of having less than one viable earth microorganism. Wow. So <laughs> essentially we have Please. less than one organism on each, uh, uh, on each part that is gonna assemble together to be a tube assembly that's gonna hold the sample. So it's very clean. <laughs> but thank you for asking that question. That was, that's a lot of hard work. It also included, by the way, having um, all of our, our, the people, the engineers that are building this hardware. Um, you saw the bunny suit picture that I, that I showed you. On top of that, the people that are building the seals and the tubes, all the parts that are going to touch or be adjacent to the parts that will touch the Martian soil, had to also wear an extra layer of a sterile smock on top, sterile goggles, sterile gloves. After they were finished with the assembly, they had to do contact plates to make sure that they didn't accidentally touch something else and transfer the contaminants on the tubes or the seals. Uh, so we did even more measures to make sure we monitor the environment, monitor the people, and monitor the hardware, and then baked it out so that we killed everything else. Uh, so yes, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Um, we've got a uh, following on from the question about autonomy and the AI we asked. Uh, uh, Matthew asks, uh, do you see any use for pilots within the future of human space flight? And um, sorry, can you repeat that? And useful pilots right. for pilots. So, so do you think we'll actually fly these these craft, or do you think we're we're going to be passengers along for the ride, perhaps? Or ah, yes, yeah. Uh, still, I think I think there would still be a use for pilots. I mean, I think there would still possibly be an, an autonomous part. I mean, we have autopilot now, right? When when you're flying an airplane, and there are parts where the specialty comes in, and there are parts where it could be automated and and you'll be just fine. So yeah, I think there's still a need for pilots, especially with humans involved. Um, but really, the the computer aspect or the or the AI aspect of really nailing the landing in a specific, very small region, um, it, we really need the help of computer and AI, computers and AI to to nail that landing zone. When it comes to humans, it probably won't be as critical but who, who knows so yes there there might be still a need uh, for pilots okay uh we've got a question here from jeffrey who um asks do we know if other countries planning to explore mars are being as careful as nasa regarding planetary protection and i think in your presentation you, you mentioned that there were international standards so perhaps you could just talk about that exactly yes there's the outer space treaty of 1967 that was signed that essentially established planetary protection and there are signatories, uh, countries who are signatories all around the world. And um, as long as you are a signatory to that outer space treaty, you are subject to these rules. So all spacefaring agencies that, that are currently on the way, they are subject to these planetary protection standards. So we have a planetary protection officer at NASA headquarters, uh, Lisa Pratt. And uh, she's been heavily involved as well to, to make sure at least within the United States, and she offers um, her opinions uh, internationally as well uh, for those who may need some guidance or help. But yeah, they, they also do take it seriously. Okay, um, the next question here, um, you mentioned that the seven minutes of terror, you know, during, during the descent phase. And the question here is, um, ha have you been in the flight control room during a previous uh, uh, seven minutes of terror and what emotions do you go through as an observer of that yeah unfortunately i wasn't there they really keep a, a lockdown on who is allowed to, to be in that control room um but i did i was watching from home <laughs> um watching live uh, biting my nails and waiting for the that moment that you saw where everyone everyone was jumping up and down um, so yeah, I wasn't physically there and this go around, I won't be physically there, but I'll still be rooting from afar. Um, and yeah, we're, we're all excited to see that, that them stick the landing again. Okay. Uh, another question here from uh, Jonathan who asks about 
um, if the perseverance rover sees evidence of extant life, is it allowed to touch it? <laughs> what happens if you find uh, life? <laughs> great, really great question. Um, so if we actually see signs of it, so the goal is to see signs of extinct Martian life, but if we were to see extant life, uh, depending on when we were going to detect it, it's, it would be hard to, to really assess whether or not, definitively assess whether or not it is a viable extant life with the tools that we have. We can detect biosignatures. Uh, we can visually inspect from afar. But in order to definitively say it was extant, extant life, we would have to bring it back to Earth and really interrogate it with all the tools we have here. So no matter what, if we see something interesting, uh, we'll collect it. And I think once we bring it back here to, to Earth, that's when that definitive um, checkbox of, yes, it is it is extant life or whatever it may be, uh, will be checked. Uh, so whatever it is, we can touch it <laughs> if it's interesting. <laughs> and then we'll find out uh, what specifically is going on with it. OK, uh, we've got a question here from Robert. Uh, this is more of a, a general question, I suppose, is um, do you think private enterprise like SpaceX or a national space agency will be the first to successfully send people to the red planet? Do you see do you see that as a is it a technological challenge or a political challenge in, in your view? Um, I, I think I, my focus really is on the techn technological challenge. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the, the politics to the politicians, but you know, it's, it's really tough. Um, and, and at least with a NASA, right, you want to do the job right, and, you, and the the money that is spent on making sure that the astronaut our astronauts are healthy and their muscles continue to stay strong, um, it, it's a big priority to make sure that it's done right and and there are um, no casualties, right, in association with that. So so yeah, it's whether or not the commercial entities are the first to actually send a, a person to Mars. Uh, we do heavily rely on the partnership. It's a synergistic relationship between private entities and and the government sector. So uh, whether or not it's a it's a partnership or or, or they leverage our uh, knowledge or whatever it may be, uh, I'm I'm sure I know the private sector will play a, a significant role in it. Whoever's first uh, is is a uh, it's a political question. But my goal and the the goal within NASA is to make sure it's done in a safe way. Okay, um, so we've got a question here from um, Alaji who asks, uh, what technologies have been developed in planetary protection that have been useful, that have been usefully implemented on, on non-space industry? So is there any, any sort of read across from, from the, the technology research and work you do into say more normal uh, applications outside space? Yeah, interestingly enough, a lot of the uh, technology that we use have been crossed over from elsewhere into planetary protection. So many of the technologies such as vapor hydrogen peroxide, uh, we use that significantly uh, actually for the Mars 2020 mission to sterilize tools. Uh, that, that's heavily used in the medical industry. We leveraged a lot of their, um, their knowledge to date um, about the different materials that can be exposed to uh, vapor hydrogen peroxide. Uh, and we've expanded upon that to add new space uh, space grade materials uh, that we know can withstand uh, that treatment. In fact, there are a set of cameras that I'm sure all of you will see the product of these cameras because there's, they're everywhere now on the entry, descent, and landing components um, so that you can see from beginning to end um, what it looks like, what it really looks like um, to land the spacecraft on Mars. And all of those cameras came from a vendor and so we had to sterilize it. And so we actually exposed it to vapor hydrogen peroxide to make sure it was clean enough. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of technologies were actually pulled in from the outside world in for planetary protection. Unlike the rest of NASA, where you see mostly it's technologies like optics in, in cameras, GPS that started in NASA and then had applications outside. Planetary protection is more, it took a lot of the outside um, developed uh, technologies and moved it in. And we've also started our own novel technologies as well, but most of it comes from the medical industry. Okay, thank you very much. Um, got a question here from Matilda who says, um, 
what will samples taken from Mars be used for? And, and I think you've spoken really, it's about looking for extinct life, but what sort of tests will be carried out? So, I mean, how do you go looking for, for extinct life? Yeah, so that hasn't been fully forged yet. So a lot of the parts I showed you about um, fetching the samples, bringing it back, and what we're gonna do here, has, is still in the formulation stage. Um, a, a lot of the collaborators that we're going to have are all international. And you know the the best uh, the best ele electron microscope could be in one country, and the best NMR can be in a different country. So it's really not yet fully forged as to how um, the samples are going to be distributed and what particular analyses are going to be done. Um, you can imagine when it happens in um, at least ten years uh, that a lot of technology development is going to happen between now and then. And so it's kind of, it's going to be difficult to pinpoint specifics, especially because maybe the technology we're going to use has not even been invented yet. So I've got a question that maybe follows on a little bit from that then, which is, um, William asks, what are some of the major research questions in planetary protection? So what, what would you like to do that you cannot do now in planetary protection? Ooh, wow, really good question. Um, so many of the, the questions that we have in planetary protection pertain to understanding what life exists here on Earth and, how, and what subset of that life could possibly survive the journey to a different planet. And so that's why we focus on different kinds of microorganisms that uh, have, can form these spores, these seed-like structures. We also have subdivisions of microbes that can't form these seed-like structures, but they're, for example, really resistant to the vacuum of space and radiation. So we like doing research because every day we find some new novel microorganisms that is almost stronger than the last one. Uh, so, so a lot of the, the gaps that we try to close is, are we sure that this is the worst case scenario and that, and that we're looking at the story conservatively so that we can ensure that we protect the, the planet or the body we're exploring? Um, and just understanding in general, if, if you know that, if you know what kind of life exists on Earth and, and how they can be a little bit stronger than the, than the usual suspects, then you can also get an understanding of what could possibly be out there and, and more of an astrobiology connection. So there, there are definitely all these questions pertaining to life and could it survive and could it propagate elsewhere? Okay. Got quite a, a provocative question here, perhaps, uh, which is uh, history on Earth shows that this could go very badly wrong. Is it worth the risk of contaminating Europa? You know, what, what, you know, I guess what's the, you know, obviously all of this is here for a very good reason, but. Uh... Yeah, so uh, we, the thing is, we don't want to be uh, mutually exclusive. We, we can explore Europa and do it in a safe way. Uh, and in fact, one of the projects that I'm currently working on is looking at a lander that will explore the surface of Europa in a way where we don't contaminate it. And that's why we're looking at these, these microbes that are radiation resistant and desiccation resistant to, to understand how, what are the limits we should set, not just looking at spores, we need to tailor it to the things that could possibly survive the journey to Europa. So it's, it's, a, it's a big problem, but a problem that we're tackling and that is tackleable. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, so we're working on being able to responsibly explore Europa uh, without contaminating it. But yeah, it is a challenge. And I think we'll probably wrap up with our last question then here. And it's really following on from what we said earlier about the, the Outer Space Treaty. Um, Matthew asks, um, with regard to the international standards that govern planetary protection, does NASA regulate private companies for their endeavors? So, I mean, how is the, uh, you know, how is it monitored that the compliance, I suppose? Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a, a really good question. Uh, I'm, they, they're all great questions, but ooh, this pertains to a, a lot of my day-to-day -day life here. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so there is actually, um, there's been a push uh, to essentially uh, make sure that there's open communication you know, with the private sector because we want to enable them to also be able to, to explore responsibly in a way that's not so financially um, limiting, right? It's doing all of, taking all of these samples like for Mars 2020, it co it's, it, it's an extra cost. And for us, it's worth it because we want to do good science. We, there are all these goals that we need to achieve. 
So uh, we just have to make sure that we are able to find ways to communicate to uh, all, all people, private, government, everyone who is trying to send something uh, outside of our planet to make sure they do it responsibly. So yeah, it, everyone is, is technically subject to this, to these rules. Thank you. And thank you for giving so much of your time to answer all of these uh, these really good questions. And thank you for your, your very informative answers. Um, if I could perhaps uh, uh, move over to Claudine, uh, my colleague from the AIAA on the vice chair of their diversity inclusion working group uh, to give the, the vote of thanks. Uh, Claudine, over to you. Claudine, I think you're on mute. My apologies. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Cooper, for not only highlighting um, Dr. Uh, Jackson's legacy, but and how she trailblazed the um, road for others like yourself and myself in aerospace, but also sharing your fascinating work within Mars Rotorcraft and your passion. We can definitely um, feel the passion that you said that um, all of the NASA workers bring to the table every day. Um, I can tell you from some of the questions that you're definitely inspiring um, the next generation of Mars explorers and following the rover is gonna really be extra special for all of us who have been able to participate and listen to your talk. This has been an exciting week um, in the United States and in the world. Um, in addition to AIAA's sci annual SciTech Festival um, Conference, um, on Monday we celebrated the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and yesterday, our new president, Joe Biden, um, and our first female African-American and Indian um, vice president, Kamala Harris, was sworn in. And today we have Dr. Cooper's pre uh, presentation. These are all testimonies of the great work that happens when marginalized communities are included in a conversation and are allowed to contribute. So let us continue to create these environments where all people can contribute harmoniously. I'm excited about the AIAA partnership with the Royal Aeronautical Society and the society's creation of the Dr. Mary Jackson named lecture and look forward to further collaborations. This was amazing and I really appreciate your um, presentation, Dr. Cooper. Thank you, Thank Claude. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Claudine, if perhaps I might let you uh, say a few words then about the work of the AAA and particularly on diversity and inclusion. Yeah, so the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics had created the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group um, to encourage participation and collaboration across genders, ethnicities, and races to enhance representation in the entire industry. So um, I am the vice chair, as you mentioned, um, and we have four subcommittees, outreach, recognitions, programming, and leadership through which we realize all of, we develop programming and implement programming to accomplish our goal. Um, I'm very excited. We just updated our um, annual plan and um, look forward to continuing the partnership with the Royal Aeronautical Society um, and bringing, um, ensuring that all communities are able to participate in the exciting explorations and um, happenings that we have in aeronautics and astronautics across the world. Claudine, thank you very much. And, and it's a great pleasure for us in the Royal Aeronautical Society to be working alongside the AAA as well. Um, so with regard to the uh, Royal Air and Northern Society Diversity Inclusion Committee, which hopefully there'll be a slide for in a moment, there we go. Um, so just to very briefly talk about our, our role. Uh, so as the president introduced, uh, my name's Richard Gearing and I'm the chair of, of the DNI committee. Um, we are very recently a committee, having been a, a temporary working group, we're now a permanent part of, permanent part of the society's uh, structure. Um, 
our role is, is multifaceted. It, we, we are the sort of sponsors for the society's diversity and inclusion strategy. Um, and in particular, as we're a uh, signatory to the uh, Diversity Concordat with the Royal Academy of Engineering alongside 30 or so other professional engineering institutions, uh, we, we use the Royal Academy's progression framework to measure our journey in, in improving uh, the, the diversity and inclusiveness of, of the society's activity. And in doing that, we work with the boards, the committees, the groups and the branches to uh, help everyone come on the journey. We're very aware that the committee on its own uh, 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 doesn't deliver DNI. This is a this is a cultural piece across our organisation. Um, we also provide that support through useful uh, uh, good practice guides. You can find them on our, our website at aerosociety.com forward slash diversity. Um, and you'll see us uh, host a number of events across the year, of which this is just one. Uh, and we were very proud uh, in September to, to be the inaugural winners of Best Professional Engineering Institution of the Year in the Engineering Talent Awards, which recognises uh, both PEIs and individuals and organisations that are that are supporting uh, the, the inclusion and diversity within uh, the engineering sector. So as I say, you can find more on our website uh, at the address on screen. So that sort of leads me really to, to wrap up uh, today's Mary Jackson lecture. Uh, my great thanks to uh, Dr. Cooper, our speaker, for her hugely uh, informative um, uh, presentation and also to our colleagues at the AIAA for supporting this event. Um, a recording of this lecture will be, uh, will be made available on the Royal Aeronautical Society's uh, YouTube channel and you'll get sent a link uh, in the coming days once that's, once that's available. Uh, that'll be freely available. Please do share it with anybody who might have uh, missed the lecture. Uh, and it just remains for me to uh, thank you all for attending and, and stay safe. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>